Well, greetings, boys and girls. Where's the music? The music. I guess it's silent today. Maybe this is just some... I had the music. Oh, you know what? They must have banned it or something. (laughs) Well, this is an awkward way to start off uh, the newest edition of Stan and Slam. Uh, (laughs) Slam and Stan. Did you just say Stan and Slam? I did say Stan and Slam. (laughs) An even more awkward way to start it. Well, we need oh, here I, am, uh, here I am criticizing all the different podcasts I hear, and I totally butcher uh, the entrance of our show, our second show. This how is did, Van... Yes? How did they not add our music? That's really uh, upsetting me. Mm-hmm. Maybe we have to start writing our own songs. Oh, you know what? The default... What, what in the world? <laughs> let, me play, let me play a song, then. Here, here, we'll play the... That. Yeah, you like that? That was a great... <laughs> Entrance. That was oh my God! Process. Okay, we may have butchered uh, the opening of the show, folks, but that music more than makes up for it. But you know, they just banned non-copyrighted music because I put music that wasn't co- this. That one, you know, is copyright. But I mean, the other one wasn't copyrighted. It was something that they recommended. Interesting. Maybe okay, maybe well, folks, this is Vandal Drummond and Alfredo Esparza, Slam and Stam. There you go. And I guess we can get the show running now. Now we can start talking <laughs> about the show. Hey, you know what? You know, did you hear the latest news about um, Juventud Guerrero now? I have not heard the latest news. What's going on with Juve? He's going to start his own wrestling promotion. How novel. A wrestler in Mexico starting their own promotion. That's now the... And, and, this, and you know the weird thing, it's not the... It's, he's the second one this week. Who is the other uh, wrestler to start his own promotion? Super Calo. Super Calo. Every... What is it with wrestlers starting their own promotions? More wrestlers in Mexico are starting their own promotions than American wrestlers writing biographies how they've been born again. There you go. But you, you, it's, it's so funny because I guess they, they, at least he got a money mark, though. So. <laughs> well, that might last for a little while, but a yeah. uh, money mark is only going to get you so far. Until he figures it out. More there were less. scores of money marks for indie promotions here in the States, and there always will be, and... They last for as long as the wrestler can suck them dry of their money. Well, let's hope this guy has enough <laughs> to live <laughs> off of, considering this economy that we're in. Yeah, it will be interesting. Well, uh, you know, I think, I think, why don't we start off with this? Is Alfredo sent me a very interesting list off the Internet, and it is entitled, The Urban Legends, Legends of Professional Wrestling. It's a fascinating list. Uh, let's see, how many urban myths are listed here? 460. And that's not including the ones you know. This is true. Yeah. Now, the, the one thing that would... The list would actually be a little more fascinating if there weren't quite as many so-called urban myths listed. Uh, and they're, kind, they're all over the place. Some of these urban myths are not actually myths. They're actually items that have been confirmed, a few even by the Wrestling Observer. Oh, there you go. A few I know a little something about. Um, a number of them are probably pure, utter bullshit. And a lot of them are probably true. And it's really, really hard to tell which are true and which are false, especially in an industry like pro wrestling where uh, people do a lot of bizarre things <laughs> and at the same time wrestlers are you know some of the most legendary bullshitters you know on the face of the earth so and and you know we talked about this before fredo the when i think of uh what's true and what's false in professional wrestling i think back to dr jerry graham uh People who have been following wrestling and know the history, you know, know plenty about Dr. Jerry Graham. But for the uninitiated, uh, Dr. Jerry Graham was one of the most famous wrestlers in the 1950s, tag teaming with uh, Eddie Graham. Uh, He made a ton of money. Uh, By the time I met him in 1981, all that money was gone, and he was living in a flop house in downtown L.A. But... He was easily the most way out person I have ever met in my life. And there are many Dr. Jerry Graham stories out there. 
occur, and you've met a lot of way out there people, right? I've met a lot of way out people, <laughs> but none. Living in L.A. Yeah, living in L.A., you meet a lot of you way out lot. people yeah. in and out of wrestling. It's true. The only person I've heard who sounds even close to being as way out is Dr. Jerry Graham, uh, maybe Johnny Valentine, whom I never met. But uh, I, when I hear people talk Dr. Jerry Graham, a lot of them start bringing up Johnny Valentine stories. Uh, Doc was known for just doing some way out antics that you, you don't picture normal people doing. You don't picture people in the everyday world committing. The, but the interesting thing is there are hundreds of Dr. Jerry Graham stories out there. And many of them are true and need no exaggeration. You don't need to insert any, um, any histrionic, and you don't need to exaggerate these stories. Yet, professional wrestlers still feel the need to add a little something more to Dr. Jerry Graham's stories. The truth isn't enough for them for some reason. And the one of the most famous Dr. Jerry Graham stories, which was documented you know, in the Phoenix newspaper when it happened, was in the late 1960s. Uh, Dr. Jerry Graham was very close to his mother, uh, and she was an elderly woman, and in the late 1960s, she got sick. I don't know if she had been sick for a while, if it was something sudden, but she was taken to the hospital, and Dr. Jerry Graham warned the doctors, you know, she better, <laughs> she better pull through. His mother did not pull through. You don't want to make through. Dr. Jerry Graham angry. That's for sure. Oh, you don't. I saw him angry. <laughs> I saw him in a more uh, a mellow, uh, angry state, oh, and that scared me enough. Well, his mother passed away, oh. and he returned to the hospital with uh, a shotgun. I believe it was a shotgun, some kind of a gun, a hunting knife, and his 12-year-old son at his side. And he fired off a uh, He fired the gun at some point. He threw a couple of orderlies across the hall, and he told people something to the extent of, uh, stand out of my way, I just want to go bury my mother. So he got her body, put it on a gurney, and he wheeled it out into the parking lot. By that time, a number of uh, police came, had a little showdown with them, they talked him down, and he went away peacefully with them. Wow. Now, that's an interesting enough story for me. <laughs> that, that's way too. That's, that's yeah, way, but somehow that's how, how not much, enough for people. I know. How much more can you add to that story? I mean, oh, I, oh, oh! It get the way other people say it happened. Uh, one story says that he threw his mother over his shoulder and went running out of the building, and her arms were flapping back and forth like a rag doll, and he tried to bury her in an abandoned lot. And in the most way out story I heard, or version of the story, I should say, is that he threw the body in a car, uh, drove it to a lake, and took his mother's body fishing and propped her up and put a fishing rod in oh. her hands. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to name who the wrestler is, but a uh, fairly well-known him? wrestler was telling me this story and he got was, very defensive when I told him that's just not true. He did not take his mother's body on a fishing expedition. Will, will you be naming him once he passes away? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> no, it's not out of fear for him. It's just, it's just okay, if, if, I, if I believe that story, and I, I did fall for some good stories in my time, but uh, I guess I'd prefer to say, hey, Kurt Brown, Lucky Pierre, Vandal Drummond, believe this shit. We've all fallen for some pretty uh, hysterical stories at one time or another. And just seeing that this was one of the goofiest stories that I don't see anybody buying. Uh, on top of that, the, the wrestler who uh, told the story otherwise was a pretty down-to-earth person and was a really nice guy. <laughs> he must be in good health, too. So <laughs> He's right. in good health. And, yes, he could kick my ass, but just about any wrestler could kick my ass. There you go. So, so that's you kind to... of a moot point. <laughs> so you want to go but anyway, that's what... Oh, I'm sorry, Fredo, you go ahead. Did you want to go through some of these and figure out which ones you know for a fact are, are true or are false? Um, yeah. You have Actually, what's funny is, is the, 
the least scandalous ones are the most interesting to me because half of these are like somebody pissed on this person, this wrestler shit on this person. Uh, yeah, yeah, those stories are old as the hills. Wrestlers shit and piss on everybody. It they happens. do that all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, and and some of the stories are true. Some of them are bullshit. Yeah. Who knows? You know. Uh, number forty four caught my interest right away because this was the one that I have a little reference to going way back when, and that is that Pedro Morales may have pawned his WWF belt. It showed up in a pawn shop eventually, and Tom Burke bought it. I don't know if it was Pedro Morales that pawned the belt, but yes, Tom Burke does own it. <laughs> oh, well, when I first met Tom Burke back in 1980, I visited his house and saw his global wrestling library, which, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's a must-see. It's like a mini-museum. Wow. And up there was a WWF belt. He told me that he went into a pawn shop in New York City saw the belt and, you know, stared at it in disbelief. I don't remember what he said he paid for it. It wasn't a fortune. It, it, you know, it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't a for fortune either. Um, and he speculated that uh, Pedro Morales may have pawned it, but he didn't say that for a fact. He said it was the one that Pedro Morales wore. That doesn't necessarily mean that Pedro Morales was in possession of it. Another thing wrestlers are notorious for are being thieves. And yeah, I mean, somebody, I could believe Pedro Morales selling it. I mean, I mean, pawning it. I mean, yeah, it's very we've possible. Heard stories, we've heard stories about Pirata Morgan doing stuff like that. Um, That's Juventus, true. Juventud Guerrero doing that at one point. Oh, did he? A, I heard. I heard about Pirata out. Morgan wanting to. Uh, well, he tried stealing um, Superboy's. His dad, That's right. Um, uh, Parata dad. Morgan was wrestling Superboy for a local indie title in Los Angeles, and he tried to talk Superboy into dropping the belt to him so he could. Uh, what was it? So he could, you know, so he could, so he could get, get it more exposure in Mexico. In Mexico. That's right. And they didn't fall for it, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Superboy yeah. had been worked by people since he was a little kid, no doubt. Because I remember him mentioning that when when I told him, did we really need belts for a wrestling promotion? <laughs> and he was like, no, not really. Nobody In fact, hold didn't it, he tell us that he even hates the idea of having a championship in an indie promotion? Yeah, he did. He he basically said it, it's just another gimmick, which works most of the time. But nowadays, I mean, every promotion has like, what, 10, 15 titles. I mean, CMLL has, I think, 19 championships. In fact, I recall that show that you and I attended about four years ago when Blue Panther wrestled Dos Caras. And what was it that uh, Blue Panther said to you when everybody was walking in with belts? Well, everybody had a belt. Remember, it was I think it was like four different light heavyweight champions from California. And then there was the AWS title, the AWS tag team title, and then like, I don't know what other belts there was. And he mentioned, he, he looks over at me and he's like, Everybody has a belt except me. <laughs> I just started laughing the whole time. <laughs> and then when I told you, you you laughed even harder because it was like... It's that was, yeah, true. I remember that better now. Yeah, that that was classic. The, the, Easily the most talented wrestler in there, and he doesn't have a belt. Yeah, and he was the one that got the, the, the ovation from the fans, too. That was an incredible match. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, what you expect? What was the follow-up right after them? Was, um, no, actually, it was a tag match right after, wasn't it? Then, yeah, but what was well, amazing, though, was it was uh, Blue Panther versus Dos Caras, yeah. and they did like an old-school technical Lucha Libre match, and this was an American crowd. Yeah. And the crowd, after they did this, this nice exchange of beautiful technical holds, the fans just started clapping and chanting, Lucha Libre, and... Uh, and then the main event was Mil Mascaras versus Kanek. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Anticlimactic was, was, after that. Wasn't Yohi at that show? I think Yohi was at that was show. Was Steve Yohi at that show? Yeah, I think that's because that's when you introduced me. Oh, I did I did not remember yeah, that. I think, I think he turned around and said, I came all the way for this. <laughs> <laughs> or some, something like that. I can't remember what he said, but we were just, we were just like... Because I, I know a lot of people were like a little disappointed in the Mil Mascaras match. But what do you expect? The no, I mean, they both are like over close to 70 by now, I mean, or over... Yeah, I actually yeah. thought it was good for what it was. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, what was it, like an eight, ten-minute match that ends in a draw or whatever? Yeah, it was like they did a, like a non-finish, like a double DQ or a double count-out. Or, I think they both, didn't they both elbow drop the referee or something? <laughs> I have no idea. I was pretty bored by that point. <laughs> I, I just remember I just remember one time Mil Mascaras worked a, a show in Anaheim, and that was the show that my sister and um, her husband went to. And I remember t- I, I had to go to the restroom, so I tell my sister, I'll be back. And as soon as I get back, the match is over. <laughs> and I'm like, is that it? <laughs> Mil Mascaras is done, and they're just announcing that Vampiro is, is, um, is, is there to take pictures and sign autographs. I'm like, great. <laughs> I guess you can leave now. <laughs> that might have been more entertaining than the match itself. Well, it probably was. Okay, rumor let's number... These... Oh, I'm sorry? Let's get back to these um, all these rumors. Or... Okay. Uh, okay, oh, rumor number 115. Uh, let me scroll down to it. Don't I look professional here? Just uh, I'm scrolling rolling down, down when I should be taking notes or something. This brilliant. is basically our podcast now. We're just we're just going to go online and, and search through the internet and ramble nonsensically. Okay, number one fifteen. A few months after David Von Erich passed away in early 1984, referee David Manning, who worked in the world class office, was autographing. David Von Erich, 8x10 pictures with David's name on it, and we're selling them throughout the year. All of this at the command of Fritz. I heard that claim made by Baby Doll on her shoot interview uh, via Rob Feinstein on the old original shoot interviews. Uh-huh. Uh, number 112, Gino Hernandez was a major Coke user. <laughs> uh, wow. F- file that under the... <laughs> You know, that's, I mean, who was it back then in, in the 80s? Yeah, exactly. Most of the I wrestlers mean, from that time period It was were, Ray, wrestler's favorite meal, I swear. I mean, it was just one of those things where everybody was was doing coke or, you know, what else are they going to Smoking pot, whatever they were doing. Yeah, smoking pot was probably the least... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was like, that was like a, oh, that's all? That's not a big deal. Uh, number 99 was Jerry Estrada... Okay. He's the Mexican uh, Jimmy Sanuka, they say. He didn't wrestle in Tijuana for years, and the person says, and I haven't checked, but maybe he still doesn't even work there. After getting into trouble th- for throwing a rat off a hotel room's balcony, he was in a brothel, as I, this is what I recall reading, uh, and the madam of the brothel had been drinking and was, was sitting on the balcony and fell off. Oh. I never heard any rumor that he pushed her. He was wanted for questioning because he was present. Oh. From what I understand, he had nothing to do with her fall. He, he's not evil. Jerry no, not no, evil. wrestlers are good people. I know. Look at that. As I sit here snickering. So then, so then we can we can eliminate that the number ninety eight, where he was making money off the drugs drug business. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> like I said, so many of these I'm certain are uh, true, so many are false. You never know because wrestling is bizarre and it's full, filled with b- bullshitters. Oh, number 156. When Chris Adams was wrestling in Portland during 1982 and 83, uh, he had his then-wife Jeannie Clark along with him. Billy Jack Haynes boinked Genie during that time period. Uh, it was a little uh, more significant than that. She was actually uh, Billy Jack Haynes' woman for a while. That's oh, when she and Chris Adams split up. Oh, so that was... Yeah. yeah, it wasn't just like this backroom affair or anything like that. She was actually... I actually used to have a friend who was friends with Jeannie when she was here in Southern California. And... Uh, she went up to visit a friend in Portland, and she heard that she was now with Billy Jack Haynes. And she went up to Billy Jack and said, um, oh, I'm a friend of Jeannie Clark's, and I guess Haynes gave her a, a very curt look and said, her name is not Clark anymore, understand? And that was all she needed to know, and she left. <laughs> oh, God. Billy Jack Haynes, there's, a, there's another guy. <laughs> yeah, he's somebody I wouldn't want to mess with. Yeah. Have you seen his, um, that, I guess they're doing a shoot interview with him? I heard that they're working on one right now. And Have you a, heard any details? 
they they already released like the trailer for it, and he just looks crazy. Like he just looks lost. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he looks like he he thinks the government's gonna come and get him or whatever. He's oh my Vince. God! So we're gonna hear him on Art Bell coast to coast tonight. <laughs> he, he's he's blaming Vince McMahon for everything that's gone wrong in professional wrestling, <laughs> which I mean, part of it. I mean, I can understand, but you know, still. Yeah, but that's a very 1980s thing to do is blame yeah. Vince for everything. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's it's just one of those crazy. It, it looks it looks kind of interesting. I probably I wouldn't buy it, but I'm sure once it's a yeah, it might be somebody, interesting if yeah. <laughs> Who, I don't know. I might actually buy it. <laughs> <laughs> From what you say, it sounds like it might be one of the more fascinating ones. I don't think I can I can help I can support you know who <laughs> <laughs> the, the person who's making that shoot interview. I cannot support someone like that. Mm-hmm. Here's yeah. one that is is actually I, I think kind of sweet, uh, and is, was actually confirmed in the Wrestling Observer. And uh, number one sixty four. Akira Hokuta and Kensuke Sasaki kept the whole hotel awake from so much love noise when they first hooked up at one of those uh, world-class wrestling slash New Japan de- uh, deals. That was written about in the Observer, and it I, it's actually kind of sweet because they uh, uh, met each other, got wowed over each other, and made crazy mad love and got married. <laughs> I mean, I think that's kind of <laughs> crazy. endearing. You weren't there during that trip, were you? <laughs> I wish I was. You weren't. I wouldn't have mind watching that. This, this wasn't a love love noise that you heard. I did not hear it. Oh, okay. I wouldn't mind hearing it. I, I think it's a wonderful noise. <laughs> you would have people falling some, crazy in love with each other. You would have made some popcorn and just listened, right? And I would have watched if I could have I spent the night just listening. If the opportunity arose, I would have watched the whole thing. How about the Missy Hyatt ones? You can confirm some of them. Which one? There's so many Missy Hyatt ones on here. <laughs> I think you can confirm some, considering you know Tom Pritchard. <laughs> uh, if I did, I wouldn't snitch on him. <laughs> no, actually, believe it or not, it's been uh, years since I've talked with Tom Pritchard, yeah. so Missy Hyatt actually has never come up in our conversations. Yeah. Last time I, I ran into Tom Pritchard was at Cauliflower Alley, I think about 15 years ago. Wow. Would love to run into him again. He's a very nice guy and one of the more more down to earth wrestlers. Okay. So what's the next what's the next one you can confirm as being true? Okay, let's see. It's funny, we were talking about doing these uh later in the show, but we're just going off with these. Wait, oh, I number one eighty eight. I was talking about Juventus Guerrero's new promotion. You switched to this all of a sudden. Yeah, I did. I know. I did I am funny how I just uh just ran to talk away about with it. This. You just didn't want to hear about Juventus Guerrero's promotion. I was really excited about that. <laughs> I was going to write a whole blog uh, post about that on my website. I would be kind of, Well, okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to Juventus' promotion. What is your take on the whole thing? Well, now that you mention it, I have no more... It's pretty much... I'm pretty much done with that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I, sw- I switched to the urban legend. I, yeah, I think I was done with that. I mean, what else can you say? It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a fun disaster to watch, you know. Yes, yes. It'll be entertaining yeah, to read about. You know what's interesting in this day and age? So many so many of us old people are kind of burned out on, you know, the pro wrestling of today. Yeah. You know, it, it just, you know it's not that it's bad. It just doesn't get me off. But um, I, I'm fascinated reading about it week to week, about the business end of it and just the train wrecks. I, I just can't watch it as much as I used to. Like some of the, well, the, the American stuff. I can watch Lucha at all times, you know, but there's, like, some other stuff I just can't watch. Yes, I am going through a Lucha Libre renaissance, and thank you for that opening music. I am I am a reborn <laughs> Negro Casas fan. You can talk, you, you can thank, you can thank Blog Talk Radio for ruining my other music. Yeah, well, maybe we could do a, something like the Billy Jack Haynes interview and talk about how the government's trying to sabotage yeah, our I podcast. Think- I think there was a plan. Oh, unless it was, rem- it must have been removed from their from their website or something. I don't know. Possibly. Anyway, it made for an entertaining <laughs> introduction. <laughs> there you go. So, so let me ask you: Is this true that they they broke Bruiser Brody's legs to fit him in a cheap Puerto Rican casket? I have never heard that rumor before. I just think that's funny. If I go, who would do that? Yeah, that is a, that is a pretty amusing one. I mean, that just sounds so wrong. Because I mean, I don't think even. I mean, I'm guessing Puerto Rico, isn't that kind of like Mexico? They're very, very Catholic or whatever. I do not know. I, I have to I have to proclaim ignorance. I mean, Puerto Rico is one of those 
places that we really don't know much about, you know, like... The, yeah, I've uh, never been there. The um, business. I don't even know anybody who's hung there a lot, so... Oh, here's one. Number 188. Brad Armstrong has appeared in adult films, including a hardcore wrestling movie called Headlock. Well, that's the other Brad Armstrong. Yeah, exactly. There was yeah. a porn star named Brad Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> cute. Oh, sure. you know <laughs> that's that? very cute. Sure. How did you know that? <laughs> okay. Here, here's here's <laughs> the I alert to you? everybody. All you guys out there who pretend you don't know anything about porn, give it up. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> Oh, did you read uh, Meltzer's Observer? Uh, I have not read it yet. He's talking about um, Daphne becoming really popular with the TNA fans. Uh huh. And he talk- he refers to everybody. The reason she's becoming popular is because all the losers think they can attain. You know, you know that they can actually. She's um, attainable. They have a and chance like, with her. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, that's just like the meanest thing to say because she's actually. I mean, I can understand. Like, it, I guess it's his way of saying that. There's a certain look that's attractive to him. So everybody else, if we think <laughs> we're, we're losers. And I'm like, dude, she's hot. That's an, yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. I know. I just thought, man, that's the... So just go to the, go to his, um, the forum. Yeah. Go, to the, go to the figure four forum, and you'll just see like this whole like 10-page thread about how, how wrong he is. And <laughs> I definitely will have to check that out. And then you can see the pics there, too. So. Oh, one of the interesting... Uh, items on this list and I bring this up because I know a specific story Uh they talk about Johnny Valentine uh, enjoying you know taking dumps in people's vicinities oh I thought you know which one I thought Jimmy Valiant did you read that one about how he loves a woman to shit on a glass yeah Yeah, I heard that about Sylvester Stallone too that's one of those uh Urban myth that goes around, kind of like the uh, the old Richard Gere loves a uh, gerbling, yeah. uh, but, but I or whatever that. it's called. I believe I believe that the Rock and Roll Express would walk in and one of them would leave and one of them would stay. Which that could possibly be, yeah, I yeah. Could, I could well, totally the reason that. the Johnny Valentine one caught my uh-huh. interest was because uh, I know of a case where he did not just shit in somebody's vicinity. The funniest part is the way this story was told to me. It was one night I was hanging with Dr. Jerry Graham when he had been drinking. And he talked about staying in a hotel in New York. I guess it was a really nice hotel. And he was blitzed out of his mind when he was telling me this story. And he says, I was in the nicest place around. And I'm lying on my bed. I'm fast asleep. And... I wake up and there is shit on me from head to toe. And then he looks at me as he's telling me the story and he shakes his head and he says, and I just thought, no, wait, wait, I couldn't have shit myself this bad. (laughs) And I just fell over laughing just the way he said it. And he's just looking at me like, like, what's so funny? <laughs> and then he said Johnny Valentine walked in the room and started laughing at him. Oh, uh, so, so apparently Johnny Valentine loved unloading on people if they were asleep or passed out drunk. Uh, That's sick. Anyways, I'm sure this is a really appetizing podcast for the uninitiated. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, come on. Have you, seen, have, you heard, have you heard some of these other podcasts on Block Talk Radio? Oh, yes, we're, yes. We're not, we're, not, we're not lowering their standards. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm just thinking about the occasional person who might stray into it and uh, not know much about the professional wrestling world, although probably most people who are listening do. I'm pretty sure everybody who's hearing this has heard this stuff. Or yes. can imagine that happening. Well, I'll go from one piece of fecal matter to another, and that's the zombie film I checked out this past week. Oh, God. Oh, How this bad was, was it? terrible. It, the thing that was frustrating about it this was a movie called Evil. It is a Greek zombie movie where zombies uh, invade Athens, modern-day Athens. It was made in 2005, and it reminded me a lot of the zombie flick 28 Days Later. It, at least, I shouldn't say it reminded me of the movie. It seemed like that's what 
the director was trying to convey. The acting was very, very good. Uh, but it's one of these movies where some sort of virus pops up. In this case, there's a bunch of miners who are underground and something infects them and when they go out on the town that evening, one's going to a dance club, another's going to a soccer game, another's sitting with his wife and daughter at home watching TV, and they become infected. They turn into zombies. They start biting everybody around them. Those people turn into zombies. They start chasing the people throughout Athens and it is the unscariest zombie film I have ever seen in my life. So they basically followed the same formula every zombie um, movie does, doesn't it? It wasn't pretty much the same. It, yes, yes. Same plot. Except what, what was really the bad part? <laughs> well, the bad part was it had a lot of potential. Oh. Very good acting, you know, very good cinematography. And then whenever the people, the characters were fighting off these zombies, they would easily yep. rip their arms off, their heads off. Oh. And then the special effects were horrible, which is not unusual for zombie movies. But when you see a really well shot movie with good acting, and then you see, uh, you know, plastic heads flying about, oh, it's really evident. It was really horrible. That plus the characters, you know, see this zombie virus jumping up and see all these zom- zombies chasing them. Uh-huh. Oh, and by the way, these were zombies that could run. I hate oh, running boy. zombies. I like slow, sloth-like zombies. That's that's the whole point of a zombie. So, you know, they don't run. Exactly, exactly. They're diseased. They're run. Yes, exactly. They drag. Yeah, They're trying yeah. to gnaw on something. And apologies to Ron Head, who I know violently disagrees with me on this subject. Uh on top of that, you know, all these characters who are supposed to be terrified by this, you know, virus that was never seen before, within, you know, a half hour into the film seem very nonchalant about all these walking dead coming toward them and are just in a happy go lucky way fighting them off. <laughs> I gave up on the movie, I think forty five minutes into it. Oh. And it takes a lot for me to give up on a zombie movie. Wow. Well it's kinda like an E C W. <laughs> you gave up on ECW as, as, as about as fast as you did on this movie, right? Exactly, that's, that's exactly. Scary. And until they bring The Walking Dead back to ECW. So did you that, even bother? Did you did you try watching the the Raw show, the commercial free Raw show? I watched in disbelief, and this is a rare thing, you by the way, it? for those of you listening wow. to the show. I'm sorry, Fredo. You did watch it. I watched a little bit of it, believe it or not. Wow. I watched in disbelief as they killed the Trump angle in the most anticlimactic fashion ever. And that's probably the most I will ever elaborate on an episode of Raw on this so podcast. So you'll be skipping Raw next week. <laughs> <laughs> right? I will be skipping Raw next week. You know, I tried watching SmackDown. I totally forgot when, what time it was on. I just don't. I'm just not really into it for some reason. <laughs> yeah, probably for the same reason nobody else is into it. I mean, it's 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 just. It's, I don't know. There's. You would think today with so much wrestling that we would be really looking forward to it. But like, I mean, because if you if you would have told us like what five six years ago that there was going to be wrestling practically every day, we would have been ex- we would have been doing cartwheels. And yeah, and to, I watch almost we, none of it. Yeah, we just don't really find it as. I don't know, it's just not the same anymore for the, for a lot of those shows. What I did rewatch recently was the movie Skidoo. <laughs> for those of you out there, you've got to check out the movie Skidoo, a 1968 Otto Preminger film which starred Jackie Gleason. Uh, and in this movie, Jackie Gleason plays an ex-mobster who's, you know, changed his ways and lives in suburbia with his wife, who's played by Carol Channing. And all his old mobster buddies want him to uh, work his way back into prison so that he can put a hit on another mobster who is incarcerated. And that mobster is played by Mickey Rooney. Well, Gleason refuses. 
So they abduct his daughter and threaten to kill her unless he, uh, you know, takes a rap for a murder, which he did not commit. Gets into the prison and knocks off Mickey Rooney. Well, he does get into prison, but he's sharing a cell with a hippie. Oh, God. (laughs) And... Jackie Gleason in this movie begins to write a letter. I believe it's to his daughter or his wife. I don't quite remember. And he takes one of the hippie's envelopes and licks it. The hippie then looks at him and says, Oh my God, you do not know what you just did. And for all of you folks from that wonderful era, yes, when he licked the envelope, there was LSD on the envelope. So this is a 1968 movie in which Jackie Gleason takes an LSD trip. And in taking this LSD trip, he learns that violence is bad and he cannot carry out the hit because it's wrong. So here is a movie that propagates the concept LSD can open your eyes and teach you what is right. Oh, God. Now, I dropped acid once. Oh, you the did? only time I dropped it. Great, that's really nice. <laughs> yes, well, there's a reason I won't drop it again is because while it, while it was a really fascinating trip, uh, the after effects were really shitty, so I don't recommend it. However, I love a movie made in the 60s in which a director like Otto Preminger and a performer like Jackie Gleason just hypes LSD. And then the next wing of the movie, he has to figure a way how to save his daughter without killing anybody. So what he and his new hippie friend do is uh, they lace the food in the prison with LSD. And every classic film star from that era uh, goes on an LSD trip while they escape. All the prisoners, all the prison guards. So you see everybody from Cesar Romero... George Raft, Peter Lawford, um, uh, Richard Keel, who played Jaws in that 77 James Bond movie. Uh-huh. They all go on this wonderful LSD trip while Jackie Gleason escapes. <laughs> Another interesting note, it is also the final film performance of the legendary Groucho Marx. Wow. And the very last thing <clears throat> that Groucho was seen doing in this film is smoking oregano in a rowboat with the hippie. It is one of the most underrated films known to mankind. And it's not something you can find on Amazon.com. Why this has not been released on DVD, I do not know. At least a, a good commercial release. But you can go to a place called Five Minutes to Live Video. Have you ever heard of this site, Fredo? No, I haven't. Oh, I was asking you where where you found it. <laughs> Let me look this up. What what was it called? It's called Five Minutes to Live DVD. Oh, actually, here's here. Okay, for those of you folks listening, and those of you who are wise enough to uh, check out the site, type in the number five mtl dot com. Are you there, Fredo? Yep, I'm here. I'm down. I'm checking it. Awesome. You can find everything from old Santo films wow. to uh, religious propaganda to a Turkish version of Star Wars. This reminds me of the type of place I think Bob Barnett would enjoy exploring. Is, is this like, is that Robert Downey Jr. in the very first? <laughs> <laughs> or, no, Mort, Morton Downey Jr. Morton Downey. What was his name? Morton Downey? Morton Downey Jr. Guy. It does look like him. I don't Morton know if Downey that is or... him. Yeah, it's him right there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, what's that? I see some porn there. So. Yeah, you can see some porn. There's a film called Exhibition. Uh, I, I wonder if Johnny Legend's DVD is here. <laughs> uh, if that. not, we that? should hook Johnny Legend up with these people. What was that? What was that show? He, he changed the title, didn't he, a couple of times? What that are you the, referring to? The, the porn he did. Oh, the porn he did. Yeah. Yes, in, I th- believe it was 2001... Johnny Legend made a porn flick. When I say he made a porn fi- flick, he 
produced and directed a porn flick with a fellow named Toby Dammit. He did not He did not perform. star in it. Exactly. Let's, let's, let's make this clear. He did not star in a porno. No, he did right? not star in a porno. And he Lucky made a Pierre film was, that... Kurt, Lucky Pierre was there. Right? Yes, Lucky Pierre does a cameo, and you do not have to fear, Lucky Pierre does not perform in the movie either. Uh, it stars Barrett Moore, who many of you remember as Veronica Kane in XPW. And it was originally titled Sex Mex. And after the uh, wild success of Nacho Libre, it was re-released in 2007 under the name um, Nympho Libre. Oh, there you go. That's it is on DVD. Fredo, do you know where you can buy this DVD? <laughs> no, actually I don't. <laughs> Are you sitting down? Oh, he has a website again? No, you can buy this DVD on Amazon.com. Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Yep, the whole uncut, uh, hardcore. Johnny made a, a page right there for for everybody on Amazon? Yes. Oh, cool. Yes. And as I, last I checked, it's still available. <laughs> I wonder if it's selling. You're going to have to ask I him. hope it is. <laughs> You're going to have to ask him. Yeah, I will. I will have to ask him. I do have to give Mister Legend a call. You're the best of Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, you found Hunter S. Thompson on this yeah, site? I I have no idea who that guy is. Hunter S. Thompson was I no, like I know everybody makes like this big deal about him, and I have no idea who he is. I actually recommend watching the documentary Gonzo yeah. to learn about Hunter Thompson. He, yeah. he wrote a lot of. He was an excellent journalist, excellent writer. But I think it's a lot more fascinating learning about him as opposed to his writing. Oh. Um, drinking and you. Hey, how about alcohol drinking and you? Oh, these are wonderful. For those people wondering what we're talking about, there are a number of drug scare flicks from uh, days gone by. A lot of anti-drug films. There are also... Some great documentaries from Christian uh, broadcasting channels talking about the evils of rock and roll. There's one, I think it's called Rock, It's Your Decision. And for those of you young ones, oh, the 1980s was a fascinating time, and I kicked myself for not taping the, uh, the Christian broadcasting shows that would we'll talk about the evils of rock music. And when I mean rock music, I'm talking things as tame as John Denver. Oh, God. Oh, yes, yes. If it wasn't, uh, if it was secular in any way, if it didn't praise the Lord, it was, it was evil. Oh, it was evil. And there were a lot of people who were thinking along these lines. Wow. And since we're straying from wrestling, I will point out that you can find some of the Sam El Santo and Blue Demon movies on this site. Where is that in the rare film noir? I or you just, I but you think just, that's probably where it is. Yeah, I think that's probably where it is. I found a homegrown called, film. I found something called Bikers. What was it called? Let me look for it. Bikers, Drugs, and Satan. Together Forever. I never heard that one, but that sounds, that sounds wonderful. Awesome. I might actually buy that just because it sounds awesome. Yeah, I highly recommend this site. For those of you, again, it's uh, 5 Minutes to Live DVD. That's uh, www. Five, the number five, mtl dot com. There, there's a fascinating array of films to uh, to surf upon here. Oh, I can't find them. The there's a blue. <laughs> I'm trying to find it. You can also get uh, let's see, Confession of an Opium Eaters, uh, oh, there is that kill, Killer Shrews, Cruising High, Cult of the Damned. Lots of great flicks here. And I guess if we want to stray back to wrestling, it's on the Mod Rock movies. And you'll Mod, you mean the El Santo and the Blue Demon yeah. flicks? Asesino de otros mundos. They have that. They have. Oh, Blue, I've never seen that one actually. Blue Demon y las seductoras, aka Blue Demon and the seductresses. And I guess the Castle of the Mummies of Guanajuato, but I don't know if that's a. That's a great movie. Oh, yeah, that is. There it is. <laughs> they have Chinese super ninjas. <laughs> I like go. that. Any super ninjas, as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to other types of super ninjas. 
<laughs> That's pretty cool. That's a cool site. This looks good. Here's one called Sarah T. Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic, made in 1975. <laughs> oh, that looks really good. With Linda Blair, you cannot fail with a movie of Linda Bet Blair, one of uh, the old squeezes of Rick James. Very easy. Yeah. Now, um, I'm trying to remember. Do you re- do you listen to Carl Stern's podcast often? I do sometimes. I haven't heard the last one. The most recent one brought up an interesting subject about the strangest places wrestling matches were held. Mm-hmm. And that would be an interesting one for you and I to cover every week, I do believe. Because both of us have seen some interesting places. What were some of the places he, he, he mentioned? Did he mention the... He met, of course he had to mention that one place where the axe-wielding... Was that the axe wheel? Oh. Well, I don't know if that the actual building was a strange yeah. place. Just the, the incident of the axe wielding fan uh, who went after the uh, oh, who was the wrestler? Um, the Joe baby Tom. face who Mike was Jackson. wronged by the heel, What's and a fan crazy? actually went after him with an axe. I know, it, Mike Jackson, wasn't it? Mike Jackson. <laughs> yeah, he was. He they, they he was going to defend um, Mike Jackson. Yeah, very very common name Mike Jackson. I was I know, blanking on it, but but no, that was that was a fascinating How incident. How could you forget about Mike Jackson today of all days? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson, yes. There you go. Yes, it was a very very uh, strange week in pop uh, pop culture history. Oh, we sure. lost Ed McMahon, Farrah Fawcett, and Michael Jackson all within a week. And then Misawa, what was it like a couple of days before that? I'm he, sorry. Misawa too, so. Yeah, a lot. Of, we've lost a lot of people this past yeah. month. Well, in uh, Carl Stern's uh, commentary about unusual wrestling places, I've wrestled in some very strange buildings, which do not seem like a place where you'd want to hold any kind of a show. And uh, you and I were talking about this a few nights ago, how it seems like the strangest places wrestling matches are held are specifically... Lucha Libre matches. Yeah, it's always. It's always it, it, I mean, considering what's the biggest, what what part of the city is where there's more lucha here in LA, Compton. <laughs> yes, Compton, I mean, South I Central. Think, I don't think we can find that many buildings that are going to be considered current, modern, or whatever. Your yes, you're the the nicest building in that area in Compton was the. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the building, but it's the shows where a, a lot of lucha was promoted since the early 1990s. The salon, something or another. <laughs> the, Del Rey, the Del Rey, wasn't it? Something. Salon. The Del Rey. It's where I got yeah. my car stolen uh, yeah. about seven, eight years ago. I'm um, surprised, I'm surprised you haven't been, brought up the whole car stolen incident in Compton. Oh yeah, that was How an did you tell interesting about incident. That? Did yeah, you tell I, you? on a whim. I decided to go to a lucha show in Compton. I think this was 2001, and you know I drove there in my beat up Toyota, and you know the parking lot was looking kind of cluttered. And I thought to myself, you know what, this parking lot's going to get packed, and I'm not going to be able to drive out of here if I want to leave early. I just kind of want to say hi to the guys and uh, then leave. So I just pulled up at the curb, parked. Went in, and I saw Superboy, Capitan Oro, my buddies, and, you know, we hung out throughout the show, and I ended up staying all night, and I was getting ready to leave, see you guys, and I go out, and no car. It was gone. And uh, this was my dumbass move of the, of the night, or of the year, actually. I went back in, and everybody was saying, why the fuck didn't you park in the parking lot, you idiot? That way your car would have been boxed in there. Nobody could have gotten to it. And I just sat there looking like a dumbass, and God bless him, Durango Kid gave me a ride home, and uh, the police found my car about two days later in pretty good shape, just, you know, things like the battery and the plugs and, you know, little parts stolen, you know, probably just some junkies trying to (laughs) sell little parts for cash. I I thought for certain it was going to go to a chop shop, and I wasn't going to see it again, and... Gotta interrupt you. We have a caller. We have a caller. Who's there? Yeah, I have a caller. Let me let me hook him up. Oh, let me see. Oh, now we don't have a caller. <laughs> they gave up <laughs> on us. Never mind. 
<laughs> I think they probably didn't. I, I just noticed it right now. You must have hung up. Or no, I they. Up. I, clicked on, <laughs> I clicked on the on air button and it didn't. Sorry, caller. <laughs> if you're listening, sorry. It was a six. Yeah, try calling so. back again. If yeah. not tonight, next yeah. week. We'll we'll figure this out sooner or later. Mm. Well, Fredo, tell me. You were telling me about a place around Juarez where there was. An odd uh, wrestling bar, set. Bar is right, right after I think it was right, right after Conan and Eddie Guerrero got jobs in Mexico City. I mean, the the I think everybody was leaving. I think Ari Romero had left also. Um, Cobarde was traveling to Mexico City also. I think he was in, in TJ also. I think around eighty nine ninety. So about that time, um, Juarez had uh, they lo- I guess they lost a building or something, and they they started running shows in Zaragoza. At this, um, right in the backyard of um, this restaurant, that it was like a taco, taco shop, and it looked like the it, it just looked really sleazy because I, I remember going there like a couple years earlier and eating tacos there, and it just looked. I mean, you go back there, you don't want to go there. It just looked really <laughs> nasty. I mean, were the, you a little frightened eating the tacos even? I, I mean, ser- yeah. I mean, and you you kind of get used to it. when you go to Juarez or you go places like that. You're kind of used to it. I think you're just happy because it's indoors. <laughs> not those, yes. Not one of those outdoor vendors. So, so when when I saw the lucha, I'm like, oh my god, that's that's um that's that one taco place that we ate um we we, we ate a couple of years ago, and 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 they're doing the lucha. And the weird thing is, like, the first match was um was exoticos, and then the second match was more exoticos. <laughs> So it was just like all exoticos. I'm like, really? What's going on with this? An all exotico show in the in the backyard of a uh, restaurant. Yeah, and you know the weird thing is, I think about about for about two or three weeks, I think they were doing their shows there, and then they they, they went back to another building, and then they came back again. And it, I mean, I think I stopped watching right after because it was really just a because it, it just it was just an awful show. <laughs> it, just, it just made for an awful show because the announcers just didn't even look into it either. Cause that's the other thing. I don't know if you ever watched um, any old lucha. Sometimes they would have an announcer, and he would be walking around the ring doing the announcing. I yeah. never noticed that. I remember seeing an old Juarez match yeah. with Conan. All I remember was Conan was on one team, Dr. Wagner was on the other, and I remember the announcer sounded like he wanted to be anywhere but there. Well, they had the, this, the, that guy, I think the guy's name was Chato Chavez or something like that. I can't remember his, his, his last name. But um, he, he would actually do the – at first he would be the one that would be standing around, you know, walking around, calling the match. And then afterwards they got this guy with this tall, skinny guy with glasses. Who would who would do the? He would be the one doing it, and you could just you could just hear him interviewing, being all excited. And they'd go to the other guy, who I guess was somewhere else or, or in studio. He just sounded like the most <laughs> bored. He was just bored out of his mind. Like, okay, <laughs> this is match. Really exciting. Oh lord. <laughs> but I mean, it, I mean, those shows were really just so. I mean, it, they were just bizarre. I must have heard the bored guy because all I can remember him saying is in a very like just dull voice, Doctor Wagner. On Hell Blanco, On Hell Blanco's about to turn into a devil, you know, in some really bored, bored voice. Yeah, and, and you know the sad thing was they would do like these really good um, commercials where they basically would they would scream like they they would have all these monster they would cut different um, portions of um, um, the horror films from the 80s or 70s and they would put them in there and like like if it was the Brasso's. They would talk about oh the the evil is coming back or whatever and and they <laughs> they would make it really exciting and then they would get to the the part where the 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 announcer would have to talk about the match and be like the Brasos are coming next week <laughs> be sure to get tickets and I was like okay <laughs> and we <laughs> wonder like, why territories die <laughs> I mean seriously and that's how, and, and if you listen to Lucha a lot of the announcers they're just like that they're just they 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 get really bored like at certain points like I, I mean Javier Yanez some of the shows that he'll call, because mm-hmm. they'll leave him alone calling the shows. He gets kind of bored towards the end, like he's like, uh, and here's here's more from this guy. And he'll, all of a sudden, there's silence, and he'll just pull a mask. <laughs> Drop kick. <laughs> or, or what is that? What is this thing where he inter? He has he has to throw in all the the jujitsu moves or judo moves or whatever. Have you ever heard him call like every move like a judo move? I've never I've never noticed that. <laughs> You never notice that? He always does that. Like, he'll just, like, he'll be like, like, and that is a move that is used in jujitsu. Uh, and, and he'll refer to it, like, to the, the reason I know. Feeling a necessity to legitimize every move made. Well, I remember this because this was about the time Taz would do that move. Remember that? What was that move that he would do? The, the, 
the, the Tasmission? Yes, the remember? Tasmission. But remember they called it something um, Japanese. I, I don't even called. remember what it was called. <laughs> well, Kurt, you haven't been watching wrestling for like 13 years then. <laughs> Yes, that's right. I, 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 I'm exactly. like Rip Van Winkle. I think I think the last thing I watched with great fascination was uh, the Peace Brothers in 1972. Oh God! <laughs> so, so we'll just have to talk about 1970s wrestling from now on. <laughs> Kurt, do you remember Terry and Dory Funk? Well, it would be Coast? fascinating because when I listen to so many podcasts, it seems like everybody talks about Raw or TNA. Yeah, and uh, I, I I get burned out on hearing that. That's why I feel guilty for even bringing up a, a little bit of a segment on Raw tonight. I was about to go into detail about the Trump angle, but I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> not only does everybody already know what happened at this angle, it's it's not worth discussing. There's there's a lot of fascinating things uh, going on, pro wrestling or otherwise, uh-huh. and none of them center around Raw. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it's just it was just it was just interesting to watch Juarez Lucha at that time, just just to see how quickly it just fell apart. I mean, it was, and I think it all fell apart when Gory passed away. I mean, it's that that's about the time it kind of he passed I mean, away in 1989. Yeah, I mean, I, that's about the time I think because I think they I I don't know about a Casa promotion the the promotion that that was running the shows. I don't know if they took more control of it, because I just remember all those guys leaving at the same time, like Conan. I think, because even Rocky Star left. I mean, that was a, that was like the big shocker, too. That's right, Rocky Star, otherwise known as Crazy 33, who was an excellent heel. Who, when I found out was Rocky Star, I was shocked. I was like, really? How is it possible that this guy can be both? At the I'm same embarrassed time? to admit it, but I was shocked, too. You were? I mean, because that was... I, did, I, I had no idea that Rocky Star was Crazy 33. I always thought it was so hilarious because Rocky Star would, would tag with Cinta de Oro mm-hmm. in Juarez, and all of a sudden he would be like feuding with him like a couple of weeks later as Crazy Thirty Three. Yeah, and, thought, and this was the late nineteen eighties, and both of, both Crazy Thirty Three and Rocky Star got a lot of publicity at the same time. He was re- wrestling under two different uh, yeah. monikers and got publicity for both of them. But that was the time when you could drop your mask twice. Remember, he dropped his mask in uh, Mexico City to, I think it was Fuerza, wasn't it, who won it? Yeah, it was, it was, in, a, it was in one of those triangular matches. Yeah, and, and then, um, or Santo, I think, won it. I can't remember which one. It was, it was Fuerza. It was Fuerza? I believe, yeah. Yeah, and then he lost it in, um, he lost it in Juarez. I just, I mean, it, it was one of those weird things where you would watch, you would be watching Mexico City, and he'd drop it, and you're like, oh, that's crazy, 33. He'd show up, and he'd be wearing a mask, and, and you'd be like, didn't he just drop his mask? Yeah, that's really that's uh, here's another funny little nostalgic fact. Back in the L.A. territory in the LaBelle days in the 1970s, uh-huh. when the territory was really getting out of control and hitting the skids, when a wrestler lost a loser leave town match, he would like let's say Mr. Ito would lose to Tom Jones and San Bernardino, then he'd lose to Chavo Guerrero and Bakersfield, then he'd lose another loser leave town to uh, Tony Rocco. And the funniest part is they advertised all these matches on TV. Oh, God. They would advertise. Like, Mr. Ito's wrestling in a Loser Leaf Town match on Sunday. And he's wrestling in a Loser Leaf Town match on Monday and Tuesday. Well, you know, it was, it was different cities, though. Maybe it was. <laughs> yeah. Was that the Bernard same Nino person Bates. wrestling in a Loser Leaf Town match, wrestling a different opponent every <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. You know, it, 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 that, that was. I think that's what that's what we lost with the internet. We lost all that stuff, like guys getting to lose their their matches like a bunch of times and us making fun of it. Oh, you could get away with it if you didn't advertise it on TV, though. I yeah. mean, that's what was so funny is the labels would advert would would they could have easy, easily gotten away with it, except to, to the most hardcore fans. But for some reason, they felt uh, compelled to push it on television, you know, that there was going to be the same person wrestling in a different Loser Leaf Town match every single night. Yeah, that's true. Well, we're, we're running out of time now, Kurt. Yeah, this is toward the end of the show. And to all you folks, if you are listening to the show or if you download the show, listen in next time, and I promise we won't spend so much time talking about piss and shit. We will talk about about more appropriate. No, no, no. We will talk about inappropriate things, but they won't be nearly as offensive. We will try (laughs) to cover some more urban legends. 
we will cover more unusual places where wrestling matches have been held that we have frequented. And I will try to cover another zombie movie. Fredo, is there anything you would like to cover next week? Well, we should plug our, our, our website. Definitely. Your site is? LuchaWorld.com. You can visit that. It's all, we, get, we update daily, practically every day. And I have my other website, FlambamJam.com. You could, you could buy DVDs. And Kurt, your website? My website is www.stantheembryo.com. You will find very shallow ramblings <laughs> on this website. Kurt. I do urge you to read it, though. I think you will get something wonderful out of it. What it is that's wonderful you'll get out of it, I have no idea. But please, frequent it. And Fredo site, slambamjam.com, so much good lucha and... Uh, other wrestling he has on DVD, you must check it out. Very affordable prices, too. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, and Fredo, I know you're going to hate that I say this, but whenever you're walking in Southern California and you see a white light streaking across the sky, it is not a shooting star. It is a heavenly handful of Monsell's powder. See you next week, folks. See you next week. Talk to you later, Kurt. Bye-bye. Bye.